So here we are, Thursday night, 3rd of July. Everybody is excited, I'm sure, about what will happen tomorrow. I've never really been part of a celebration, a full of July celebration in America. Independence Day. See what it costs to get become independent. <laughs> It's nice to have a place where we can unload, isn't it? Unload, download all the all the miseries of life. That's what the meditation is about, isn't it? Most of the time, we have no idea what goes on in ourselves, and suddenly we download and get the messages of the mind. We, we feel overloaded often. Yeah. Don't know what's going on. And so when we begin to sit, you notice, you say, oh, and I did this and I did that, but she did this and she should do that and I don't remember what I did. And, blah, blah, and, I, and he cut through me in front of me and I forgot the eggs and I, you know, all sorts of things goes on in the mind. And very often we can't make sense of it. We, you know, we have all these kind of various sentences that come up, words, feelings, moods, um, which we take very personally. And um, it's quite confusing. You know, we don't know what, how, what, how to make sense of what goes on in ourselves, do we? A lot of the time. We try to make sense. In fact, we spend a lot of energy trying to make sense of our life, don't we? Trying to find some meaning. I think when we were all 20, we were really trying to find the meaning of life, meaning of existence. Why are we here? But there is an important question. You know, why are we born? What is the point of being born as a human being? Why do we die? What's the point of dying? Do we have any control over death? Do we have any control over birth? You know, this is an important question, isn't it? Why are we born? What is the... And we forget that. We forget this question. So we can squander our life, energy, time in useless things be distracted forever and then feel guilty and distract ourselves from the guilt and so on and on. So the mind is never really at peace very much. Trying to find some sense in a very uh, nonsensical life experience, trying to find some meaning, trying to find the purpose of um, being human trying to organize a world, trying to, to, trying to organize George, make sure he doesn't do too many foolish things. That's really a pretty difficult task, isn't it? If not an impossible one. But don't we spend, some of you who are maybe more politically <coughs> inclined, I mean, how many times have you reprogrammed the American government in your mind? So that if only you are the head of it, those things won't happen. So the experience of being human is very much one of feeling very isolated and very helpless in the vast universe, trying to create some kind of reality. And we often fall into two modes. Either we think too much or we want to annihilate our thoughts. That's what people do most of one's life, for many people, most of their life is to um, try to control life in one way or another by trying to think. 
think, think, think. And then you get fed up with thinking and then you start annihilating yourself with anything from TV to drugs to drinks to activities that just um, are more pleasurable than having to bear with the result of unskillful thinking or unskillful actions or unskillful speech. So the path of practice is really a path that takes courage because it demands that you are really fully aware and taking responsibility of your life, taking responsibility of what you do and notice. Most of our energy is spent, unless you're really quite enlightened already, most of our energy is spent about thinking about me, me, and me. Isn't it what takes most of the space of our life? What I, you know, what, what I, I, what can I do? What I, what I, where will I go? What will I do? What do I need? What do I want or what I don't want? And so on. So this I has really a, a huge importance in, our, in the way we, we approach life in our life, period. And I don't know if any of you have heard a quote from Shinryu Suzuki, but which is really to the point when he said that 99.9% of our life we're thinking about me and there isn't one. <laughs> it's kind of funny, isn't it? Because we know at some level this is true. We wouldn't be laughing otherwise. And at the same time, we have to disentangle this predicament so we can begin to really um, walk in the right direction. You know. And the Buddhist teaching is very, can help us. You know, to, we have a, a kind of very um, clear map of the mind, clear map of what brings suffering and what doesn't what bring good effect in our life and what doesn't. <clears throat> Teaching that helps us to understand what ignorance is about. Often we hear the word ignorance, avidya. Vidya means knowledge and the avidya means not knowing. We try to understand what avidya is about and we think to ourselves, how can I be so stupid? Something so obvious as saying some angry words to someone. You know, I, we, we all know at some level that this is unskillful. We all know that the result is unpleasant. <coughs> Our relationship will be maybe perhaps damaged forever when we speak in, with angry words towards, with someone. Yet, how many times we fall into the trap? We know better, and yet we don't know. So this is, uh, the path of practice is a very humbling path, because it keeps reminding us that we don't know. You know. So we start from the beginning. The very beginning is how do we live our life? The Buddha always start from the from the the, the root base. He's, he's not really concerned so much about the ultimate reality, description of the ultimate reality, because he knows that's what people dri- that's what drive people crazy to start thinking about what that that about that which is beyond thinking. That's really a sure way to go mad. But there is a lot of emphasis on just the path of um, the, the the practice of rightful, right, right, right action, right speech, right, right livelihood, right, right, you know, 
when some people were discussing with me about this word right, so there's right, there must be wrong, and that we fall. They, they said, that's dualistic. You know, there's right and there's wrong. But it's interesting because the word sama, which is right, translated as right, sama diti, right view, sama sankapa, right uh, thinking or right, um, right thought or right intention, also sometimes translated sama sankapa. This right is an interesting word because it's really neither right nor wrong. You could say more skillful, or that really leads to a, a happier state, a more peaceful and fulfilled state. When you rise above the habit of um, selfishness, self-centeredness and stupidity, the heart always rejoices. It takes a little bit of effort, but through experience you begin to sense how much, you feel so much happier when you begin to put a little bit of effort in the way you speak, in the way you think, in the way you act. You know, throughout the day to day, you know, in your work situation or in your family situation, how many times have you fallen into a state of negativity, of despair or giving up on someone, giving up on your parents or your child or how many times during the day there has been thoughts which you haven't even seen, but which were destructive. Yeah. So when you look at those train of thoughts which are really not helpful, the looking itself is a is a skillful thing. The looking itself, the mindfulness itself of, let's say, an unskillful train of thoughts or unpleasant, unkind, angry, selfish, whatever. The, the, the attentiveness that you bring to that train of thought is in itself a skillful mental state. That's why mindfulness is so important because that's the only function in the mind that will take you out of habits, will free the mind from habits. Without the faculty of mindfulness, awareness, there's very very little hope for really freeing the heart of its of the suffering that we have accumulated over many lifetimes. The karma of unskillfulness that has been accumulated. Just in this lifetime, that's enough. (laughs) Not because we intentionally uh, willed ourselves to be unskillful, but just through ignorance, through avidya, not knowing, through unawareness, through lack of mindfulness. And there is a statement in the Buddhist teaching which is powerful. It says that mindfulness leads to freedom. Heedlessness leads to death. Those who are mindful never dies. Those who are heedless are as already dead. Mindfulness is a path to the deathless. Hatefulness is a path to death. Those who are mindful never die. Those who are heedless are as already death, dead. You know, it's a verse in the Dhammapada. So, we've got enough to chew on for quite a while on <laughs> reflecting on this teaching. What it is to what is it to never die? We're all looking for a greater life at some level. You know, we feel our life is limited. Perhaps, sure, most of us feel we could do better. We have a 
potential for being more fulfilled, more alive, more, you know, more alive. And yet, our actions always lead us to a place of dying. You know, whenever there is unawareness, then we are caught into the the arising and the passing way of our mind, and we are dying. Every time something arises, we get, oh. And then when we die, we get, oh dear. We get depressed. Or we grieve endlessly. So we don't realize that what we, the suffering that we feel is really just a manifestation of this attachment to birth and death. You, know. you can see this very, very simple things. In our practice, my practice, I, um, you know, there are certain things in our monastic life which become very apparent is the forces of greed or the forces of anger. In a monastic training, things are highly highlighted, intensified. People think there's still the myth of the monk and nun living at peace on their cushion for the rest of their life once they've entered the monastery, monastery door, through the monastery door. Many people don't realize that when you enter through the monastery door, you're not get, going to get away with anything, and not only that, but you're going to get it. <laughs> yes, some people look at me skeptically. Oh, monks and nuns smile. They look kind of bright and happy. They look peaceful sometimes. They seem to have such an easy life, just meditating all day. But you don't enter a monastery to have an easy life. And this I knew, fortunately, from the very beginning. That was not the place where I would have an easy life. Because when you enter the training that a monastic training offers, then you enter also the, the, you know, the battle of the mind which aspire to be free and Mara which is so beautifully depicted in the teaching that is completely committed to bound you and to um, imprison you into the world of delusion you know, to box you in into that world of avidya. So entering the battle is not an easy way out. Sometimes Buddhism can be presented as a nice psychotherapy alternative. When everything fails, just go to Buddhism. You know, as an alternative. As a, as a path that maybe is going to make your life a little easier, your ego a little bit more friendly, your habits a little bit more manageable. <laughs> so that instead of wanting to be free, we get even more deluded because now we feel comfortable. And the sense of comfort is really what puts us to sleep completely. So we don't know unknowingly. We're looking for comfort. Even using Buddhism, the Buddhist path, as a way of creating, of acquiring, acquiring more and more the sense of inner comfort. Not inner freedom. Inner comfort. And that comfort itself is the very thing that puts you into a nice lulling state. Sleep. And that's not the way to freedom. That's not how you liberate your mind. So when you enter the training that the Buddha actually offers, whether it's to his lay disciples or it's uh, his uh, lay disciple or his monks and nuns, this training is the same. It's going against the grain of greed, hatred and delusion in your everyday life, 
you first need to find out what those forces, the ways you, you need to find out how those forces affect you. Most of us, it's so those forces are so much part of our system that we can't actually see them. We just feel a sense of ill at easeness, but we don't really know where to begin to to see the way they are. the way they drive the mind. You know. Imagine that you come home, you have your partner or your husband or your wife or you and somebody is saying, Well, let's go to the movie tonight. I mean you don't feel very good. You know, how are you going to respond? Are you going to say, Oh well, maybe that's nice, let's go to the movie. Or say, Well, I just want to do what I want to do. I want to sleep. I want to, and then maybe an argument ensues. You know, out of what? Two people wanting two different things. Which one is, which one is, who is going to give up? And if you give up for, you know, to make somebody happy, how much are you going to tell yourself that you've been diminished by that? You know, that somehow going along with somebody else's agenda is uh, undermining your sense of self. Undermining, not strengthening, not empowering. You know. So we, we live our life very much um, committed to our personal agenda, the agenda of me and mine. The Buddha saw the danger of that. You know, of always doing things according to what I want what I need, what I, what, I, what I wish. And when we extend ourselves to perhaps the wish of somebody else, or the need of somebody else, we feel that we've losing, we're losing ground. We are not ourselves anymore. Which is another way of expressing it, I'm not a fully empowered me and mine ego. You know, the path of freedom never loses through letting go. The liberator, the heart itself that is aspiring to be liberated, never loses through letting go. It never gets diminished through letting go. It it is always uh, strengthened and empowered. Now in a culture like ours, it's very difficult to understand that because there's been so many movements in this country to bring a sense of self-confidence, self-empowerment, self-trust. That the idea of moving away from that, it's almost obnoxious. There's something appalling about not having the sense of self as the central character of our life on the stage of our life. To imagine that the sense of self not having its say in everything that we do, its say in everything that we want. Have we ever questioned what is the difference between the sense of I and what truly we are looking for in this life and what the I is looking for. Have we ever questioned that? Interesting. Have you ever got interested in that? You know, what our desires are committed to and what underneath the heart itself is committed to. You know, that's not easy to um, distinguish one from the other. It's not easy. There is uh, a couple of words which are worth mentioning, which may help you to find make the difference. Desire in Pali is called tanha, which means desire, clinging also. Yeah. Tanha. 
So people, when they hear that tanha is the cause of suffering, and the Buddha said tanha is, quote-unquote, bad, you know, people say, well, does that mean that I should not want anything? I should not wish for anything? I should not have any desire? Well, Ajahn Chah said, if you did not have any desire, you'll never have Nibbana experience either. Because it's because you have desire that you come to the end of desire and the experience of the ending of the desires that are caused by greed, hatred and delusion. Because you have desire that you can be free. Without desire, you will not need to to be free. So people say, well, um, well, what do I do then, though? Because if my desire is unskillful and I don't want to act on them, then I'm left with nothing. (laughs) Because I want things, you know. I want to be happy. I want to be good. I want to be, you know, I want my ice cream once in a while. I want my game. I want my new computer from time to time. I want my new car, my new partner. I want something. A new Buddha, Rupa. A new shrine room. I want a new Dharma center. I want new windows. <laughs> a new carpet next door. A floor that is not creaking. How many of you have wanted this here? <laughs> probably occupied a lot of your meditation space here. And how much anger has been fueled through just hearing people kind of tiptoeing on this dreadfully noisy floor. <laughs> Wanting to murder them sometime, I'm sure. And people tiptoeing, trying to be really, really careful. And you think, God damn it, you know, they're so insensitive. So, uh, fortunately, going back to Tanha, there's another word in Pali which is very handy. It's called Chanda, and also means desires. And Chanda is really what we need to practice. Chanda means zest, interest, desire that come from the joyful interest in something. And it's usually, um, mostly, uh, has connected, uh, sort of have positive connotation. The chanda for practice. It's like the zeal, the zest, the faith, the, 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 the uplift that you feel when something is working. Of course, we attach to it and we get disappointed when the chanda is gone. Like what happens after a retreat, you noticed. When you, are, you go on retreat for 10 days and you got immense interest, wonderful chanda, especially if you like the teacher and you love the meditation and you love the Dharma talk that this teacher gives or she gives or he gives, you know, and then you get this uplift in the heart and you want to practice diligently for the rest of your life without flinching. And then comes the end of the retreat and within two weeks, it's all gone, down the drain somewhere. And you wonder what happened. Well, chanda is gone. And then desires have taken over. <laughs> and unfortunately, we don't have a lot of control of this. Uh, we don't have a lot of control of desires because desires, you could say desires, tanha, in, in, that, in that sense, tanha is often, is, is really, uh, has a negative connotation in the sense it's always associated with desires that are Motivated by greed, hatred, and delusion. You know. So, a tanha is never a good news. But it's good news if you can approach it with wisdom and with mindfulness wisdom. What they call in, in Thai, they have a word, sati panya. You often, you very rarely do you have sati without panya in Thai language. You know, in, in the forest monastery teachings, they of, most of the time they have sati panya to uh, link together. So it's never just mindfulness, it's mindfulness and wisdom. Or sati sampajanya also. Mindfulness and clear comprehension. <coughs> sampajanya. So here in the West we use sati often on its own. But in many of the meditation masters in Thailand will use two words, sati panya and sati sampajanya. You know? 
One means satipanya, means mindfulness and wisdom. And the other one, satisapajanya, means mindfulness and clear knowledge. Because mindfulness, it takes mindfulness to do most of the things we do in life. But sampajanya is not always present. We don't see clearly. We don't have clear knowledge of what we experience. So sampajanya you know, leads to um, understanding of the three characteristics of existence, anicca. If you have really some pajana, then you see clearly that your thoughts are impermanent, your thoughts are not self, your thoughts are unsatisfactory. So to go back to chanda, I haven't lost the thread, to go back to chanda, it's interesting that uh, to hear this word and to contemplate this word, because this is what is often missing in our life, the chanda, the interest. And we don't have to be particularly uplifted or highly interested to have a sense of interest. When the mind has a nice uh, a kind of balance between uh, a focused mind, uh, which is energized, and, where, where mind, and when mindfulness is present, when you have those three factors, mindfulness, concentration, and energy, then there is a kind of zest there, a buoyancy in the heart which we often have difficulty in tapping into when we just live our everyday life without that quality of, you know, focus, uh, mindfulness, and energy. So chanda would imply that, would imply that you are really, um, there's a buoyancy in the heart. And so in our everyday life, every activity that we are um, you know, exposed to or part of can become, a, a, you could say, a catalyst for those qualities to emerge. You know, whatever we do in our life, the kind of the work, our profession, the people we meet with, our families, our, you know, whatever activity, we can really bring that sense of zestfulness and chanda, virya, energy and zest and discover what is it that will bring that about? What is it that will turn a situation that make you may, maybe make you depressed or is, has, uh, is perceived in a negative way and it perceived, brings a kind of a, a low, uh, a kind of a low feeling about it? You know, how can we bring zest and chanda into it? And that really, uh, that, that quality requires an inquisitive mind, you know. Without a sense, that spirit of inquiry, life is just a kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of, we don't notice the details and we just get caught into the humdrum and boring aspect of life because many things repeat themselves again and again and again and we don't know how to inflate them, so to speak, breathe in through those humdrum, quote-unquote, activities of life. We don't know how to breathe in to them this zestfulness and interest and shanda, virya, energy. So when you go home, for example, in your family, in your part, with your partner, with your friends, with your, with your job, find out how you can turn this situation into something that is truly alive, that brings, that can be lived with aliveness, joy, zest, interest, and happiness. Ask yourself, you know, most of you have done therapy and you've learned that we have to take responsibility for our life. We can't just carry on projecting onto others our problems. We can't, you know, make other people responsible for our misery. You know, many of you have known that for years. And yet you're still doing it, aren't you? You're still waiting for somebody to save you. But now, isn't it interesting to start questioning what is it that is needed in a situation, you know, to make this situation a joyful experience of um, 
a, a liberating experience, which has nothing to do with comfort. It has nothing to do with just feeling more, quote-unquote, happy and content. You know, not contented in the sense that is uh, the word contentment that is known in, in, in the Buddhist practice, but just kind of, you know, getting by with things. Most of us, it's not that we want that, but most of our mind is only trained just to get by with things. And it's about time we train it to actually experience the joy and the happiness of our life. It's, it takes training. It's not. Ha- it doesn't happen overnight. It's, that's why it's joyful, because it's like a training. And it's always something to do. People say, oh, don't do anything, just be. Yes, that's part of the training, just to let things be and look. If you spend your whole life kind of shuffling and reshuffling things and reorganizing them and pushing them away and you know and, and, and reacting to them, you never see what's going on. You can't even begin the training because you have no idea what to train. You don't have a clue where to go and you don't have any idea what's, what's happening. So when we say just let things be, it means stop letting your habits drag you around helplessly, endlessly, and hopelessly. You know, stop letting those bad habits drag you by the nose. You know, and and turn around and say, okay, what can I do now? Now, the, the heart is full of resources. It's full of potential for dealing with life skillfully. But we are, we'd rather be asleep and going back to sitting in the sofa, looking at watching TV, drinking, thinking about the next holiday, don't we? Natural, isn't it? It's human. <laughs> There's nothing bad about it, it's just human. (laughs) But look for the transcendence and you won't find it there. (laughs) If you really want to transcend human condition, you have to do some work. (laughs) It won't happen just like that. You know, it takes a little bit of interest in the truth, the unborn, unoriginated, Nibbana. You know, I think it's been lost, Nibbana, in the whole Western Buddhism. There's a lot of, <laughs> I don't know why it is anymore. <laughs> My teacher at San Sumedho hammered for years, decades, you know, about beginning. There is the unborn, unoriginated, unformed, uncreated. If it, was, if, if it wasn't, this is a quote from the Buddha, if it, if, there wasn't, if it wasn't for the unborn, unoriginated, unformed, uncreated, there will be no escape from the born, the created, the formed, and the originated. You know. So when you come to a Dharma center, you are actually stepping into the realm of looking at the, that which is originated, formed, created, conditioned, born, but you have no idea what is the unborn, uncreated, unoriginated, unformed. You know? Yet this is what we are heading towards. In fact, one of our senior teachers many years ago said, you know, we are doomed to Nibbana really. <laughs> but we don't know it, do we? So I think it's very important to keep that in mind though, to keep that in our heart, you know, to know that the reason we practice is actually to realize the unborn, unoriginated, that which has, remember, Mindfulness is a path to the deathless. How many of you are walking the path of death thinking you are mindful? Or the path of rebirth into a heavenly realm? Maybe you want to go to the two-sita heaven or the, you know, one of those deva realms. Realms of beauty and happiness, sitting in the lotus forever, singing and listening to heavenly music, never be unhappy again. But that's not the path of the Buddha. The Buddha's path is about realizing the ending of suffering and liberation from birth and death. So, 
when you leave your, you know, when you go back to your, your everyday life, there's birth and death all, all around, is there not? So we have the perfect field to realize the unborn, unoriginated, that which is not born. Because we can see birth and we can see death and we, through awareness of the arising of birth and the ending of, you know, the death of all our activities of the mind, then we can realize the unborn. And this is something that is not describable. So it's not something you can find in books, even though people have written PhD on Nibbana. You know, thousands of pages on the unborn. Undescribable. Yet the Buddha, in the, in the teaching of the Buddha, you find number of reference to Nibbana. In fact, there's about, there's over 30 adjectives that are pointing to Nibbana. I mean, I'm not going to tell all of them because I don't remember all of them, but just a few, like a refuge, an island, the marvelous, the wonderful, the, the peaceful. That's all I remember right now. I haven't looked at the Sutta for a long time, but you know. So it has some very positive connotations, as you can see. But we lose touch with that, don't we? We're just going, driving, eating, drinking, sitting, meditating, meditating, sitting, reading, reading books, reading tons of books, doing lots of retreat, just to be more happy in samsara. <laughs> How do you want to get out of it? You know, you're going to retreat so you can actually not notice the wave so much. You know, go to retreat so you can just kind of feel the wave but to the point where they don't bother you anymore. Not because you're more liberated but because you've learned how to live with them without much awakening. You know. So, um, try to see the difference, you know, in your life. And it takes effort. You know, awakening to the wave of samsara, the realm of birth and death, so that you can continue to liberate your mind from those forces, from the realm of rebirth. And doing lots of retreat, lots of practice, so that you can be so content with yourself, so comfortable with yourself, that even the wave of samsara don't bother you anymore. <laughs> Not because you are liberated, but because they, are more, they become very comfortable. You, you made some really nice waves now, that have a nice shape of a hammock, and you kind of hang in there. I'm not saying you do that, just in case you do. <laughs> just in case that you turn your practice so that you can... And I did, I did give talks that talks about surfing the wave of, of samsara. But when you surf the wave of samsara, you're already out of them. You know, you're not kind of getting drowning constantly into the, you know, into the rhythm of those waves. So think of uh, realizing the unborn and unoriginated, you know, as think of surfing. And when I watch surfers, I never surfed myself, when I watch when I watch surfers, they seem to have a lot of fun, especially when they become more professional. You can see those that keep kind of falling and into the water and splash, having to get themselves out and up on the board again and so on. It's not so much fun. Maybe it is, but... So, I wish you to really continue your practice. And remember, the practice is not supposed to make you feel comfortable. They have a saying in Chinese, from the ancient time of passive, of people with, you know, who have the wisdom of, of practice. If you feel good, be careful. 
And I'm saying is this because I have to work with it myself. You know, I, I work with that often because our, you know, our delusion is is really totally 100% committed to make you feel good. That's why when Ajahn Sachito taught us once, he said, you know, the feeling of delusion is actually the most comfortable feeling in the heart. It's quite sweet, really. <laughs> So, watch out for that feeling of comfort. Don't think it's the end of the path. You know. The end of the path has nothing to do with the feelings, what you feel. Or the end of the path, you know, has nothing to do with your life, the way your life is. Your life could be a wretched experience, but you could be free. You might be, you might fail. You might actually get it all wrong. Still, you might be free. It has nothing, it's not the value judgment that we set upon our life is, can be very distorted, you know, from this materialistic view on, on things. You know, if you're successful, rich, healthy, happy, you know, you get all the right partners and you, know, you see, oh, they are doing really well. But then try to find out and meet them again 20 years later. There haven't been much practice in their life. I think you've met enough of those kind of people to know that that's not the the end of the of the road, is it? So um, I wish you to develop lots of chanda in your life and the confidence that you can do it. You know, the confidence that you can actually withstand the forces of Mara. You know, all the great disciples of the Buddha. Whenever Mara came to challenge them, including the Buddha himself, one sentence they always came up. When Mara came to tempt them and to tell them that what they were doing was a waste of time, how much more important it will be for them to get married, have children, pile up merit, and enjoy life, they will say, I know you, Mara. They didn't say, oh, the terrible thing. They say, I know you, Mara. I've seen the limitation and the drawbacks of what you're offering. I'm not interested, sorry. So Mara is kind of described very sweetly in the scriptures. She, she or he always kind of goes away, disappointed, with drooping shoulders, miffed, kind of defeated, and we need to know that that force in ourselves, you know, anything that prevents you from doing that which is good, you aspire to the good and you don't, you know, something, oh, yeah, I don't think, oh, I, maybe tomorrow I'll start, you know. Watch out for that, you know, for that moment. I'll do it next week. Oh, that's all right. We don't need to so, sort that out. We're fine. We're okay. We can get, we get by. Watch out for that soul. This is Mara in disguise trying to lull you into a nice dream state. You know? Or you do something unskillful and you say, oh, never mind, you know, nobody knows, nobody sees me. No one sees what I'm doing. But don't worry. Other things are seeing you. you know? Nothing escape. You know, from our conscience, nothing escaped from karma. You know, somebody told me that um, uh, I think he's uh, the ambassador or the consul, or the, the Thai consul in New York, and his next step probably will be the ambassador in New York. And in front, as you come into his room, is a a saying on the board that you see, there's nothing more powerful than karma. So when people want him to do something unskillful, then they get the message straight away. There's nothing more powerful than karma. Okay, well, I've talked a lot. I think I'll end on this. And do you have any questions that you like to ask me? Mm-hmm. Speak a bit louder. In your city. Yes. Um, did I hear you correctly? That sitting is not supposed to feel good necessarily. 
Well, sitting can feel very good, yes. When there's concentration, when you concentrate the mind on one object, for example, you feel very comfortable after a while. When the hindrances are not present, you feel very happy and comfortable, you know. When you're not attached to love and hate, restlessness and worry and doubt, when you have let go of that even for a moment, you feel very pleasant, you know. But the pleasantness is not the end of the work, of the task, you know, it's just a, a stepping stone. Okay. okay. That's that's a danger. That's a danger. No, you're not supposed to feel pleasant. You know, if you practice concentration, at some point you're supposed to feel pleasant. You know, that's a different kind of practice, focusing on one object. You know, so it's very clearly described the, the practice of concentration. But the practice of vipassana, just seeing the way things are arising, is actually not supposed to be that pleasant because you see the instability of the body and mind. And that's not so pleasant. I mean, you can, once you detach and you let go of your desire to have things differently, that you can have a lot of peace and yet see the rising and passing away of mind and thoughts and feeling and body and so on. Yes. Just to be really still with that, you know, remain really still and focused on what's happening. Well, even if you are bothered, see the fact that you are bothered. You see, in, in practice, there's no really should or shouldn't. There's no way you, you don't have to be anything particular. That's right. Just observe it. You know, and even the process of observing, it takes a long time to know what it is actually to to be an, to be observing. It's not something that you have to. But mindfulness is always present. Can, oh. I mean, can can be present or not present, but as long as mindfulness is, is present, then there's a, then then there's life. I was saying, you know, which means as long as mindfulness is, pre- is present, then you are learning something. You know, you continue to learn. You might, you know, being an observer feels strange. People say to me, "Well, I'm like a second super ego watching my ego." You know, I feel like I'm separated, or I feel I'm. Two people, one watching, one of, you know. But the more you are aware and the more you continue this practice of observing, then the more you, you start letting go of that sense of being separate, you know. So this is really the, the, the awareness itself is, is a realm of learning. Nothing is wasted. In fact, everything is a, is, is, is a profound lesson when there is awareness. Like if you sit in the middle of suffering with awareness, then you will come out, transform, and a much happier and confident and stronger person. But you have to learn how to sit. Not necessarily sitting on your cushion, but you sit here in the heart you know, with the presence of mind. Any other questions? Yes. Um, yeah, in post interactions, post relationships, I seem to I get that I'll trip up. You trip up? Can you explain what that means? <laughs> <laughs> you think I've got it, haven't you? <laughs> you think I wouldn't trip up in intimate relationships? Well, uh, because, you know, when we, when we have, you know, my experience is, you know, I was married for 10 years, but still I find that my community's experience is much more, you know, it's actually there's an intimacy in our relationship which is quite profound and deep. And so when you come very close to people, you know, even though you may not have a sexual relationship with them, you know, just, just living together, you know, community's life is like that. You, it, you know, people really push your buttons in all directions. So you might not be aware of that, that you have your button get pushed. You know, maybe you have an idea of how it should be, or you have an idea about how you should be in that relationship. You don't realize that a relationship, when it's intimate, you know, it really touches deep layers of, of one's mind. And so um, maybe you're not ready to look at that, you know. Maybe you think a relationship might solve your problems. You might have a, in the back of the mind an idea that relationship will make my life a little better. 
or there will be more love or more, you know. And then you'll find that, that as you come close to one person or, you know, that they may be, even without knowing themselves, not knowing, that, you know, bodies do that to each other. You know, you just sit next to one person and see if that person is angry, you start feeling angry yourself. You're not careful. You know. So having an intimate relationship is hard work because then you have to work with somebody else kind of karmic predicament. Not just yours, but everybody else. So, um, I don't know what you mean by tripping up. That would be an interesting... I, I lose track of the, uh, the mindfulness and the strength that I thought I had. And what happened? I get weak and uh, unmindful. You give up? I, or give in? Yeah. Hey, it's too soft. Or derail. Huh? Or I derail. You derail. Uh, from what? Okay, so you lose mindfulness, in other words. Well, now you've got your challenge. Yes, you get blinded, don't you? By infatuation. That's what infatuation is about, you know? You get enthralled, and you've lost it, you know? It's really hard. It's really hard. It's not, it's not an easy thing. But don't give up on yourself, you know? Um... You can even talk to your partner about that. How about that? That you lose mindfulness in relationship. Maybe she can help you or he can help you. I don't know which loyalty you have to, but maybe she can help you to be more mindful. How about that? And you can help her to be more mindful of you and vice versa. Does that sound a reasonable possibility? I think it's important in relationship, if you're going to be walking the path, you have to help each other, you know. And you have to not be afraid to show your weaknesses, you know, to show your, your, your shadow side, you know. You have to be able to, if you can't, if you can't open to that together, you'll never go anywhere. you just be re- living in a dream, trying to you know, sustain that kind of a dream state of delusion. I mean, that's how I would approach it. Hmm. That's enough? Okay. Another question? Okay. One more question? Thank you, Jim. My question is, if you're sitting in meditation and you have, say, a pretty good sense of um, awareness, Separation from, you know, the thoughts, whatever's going on in your life. Yes. And so your sense of awareness is strong. You're sitting that. What's the effect of introducing intent? An intent? Yeah, intention in that space of awareness. Um, you know, the mind always needs all the help it can get. So it's not like, um, you know, an intent is like, in like what, for example, what, what intend to be mindful or intend to be kind or intend to be developing loving kindness or intent of being more patient? Or? Um, I was thinking along the lines of, say, uh, something like compassion. Right. If I'm, if I'm really quiet and I'm in a space where I'm really neutral to what I'm, what's going on around me, and most of my sense, uh, and even the eye is sort of, the eyes are sort of out. But there's a very strong awareness that is active, active awareness. And if then I alter that by introducing some intent, and perhaps compassion is a good word, then I guess what my curiosity is then the effect of that. Yes. Um, well, intent is just a use of thoughts. You know? So, um, most of our the stream of our thinking most of the stream of our thinking is very much linked up with greed, hatred and delusion or attachment of some sort you know. so um, you know, there's time when you can just be mindful to practice of bare attention 
And there are times when you can introduce intentions which will affect your mind stream. Okay? So it's le- le- working at different levels, you know. The, the mind stream can be uh, fed with positive thinking, you know. But if you believe in your thoughts, then it won't work because you'll get attached to positive thinking. Okay? So you don't need to believe in positive thinking, but you know that when you, because a lot of our thoughts are quite negative and destructive, then to bring into the mind a habit of having different kind of thoughts, it's like infiltering some other mode of thinking. You see what I mean? Yeah. So, um, you know, for me, uh, who, like all of you, you know, was quite critical type of mind and quite... Uh, cynical or unbelieving type of mind, you know. When my te- when and fortunately I had a teacher who was a bit like me. Well, that that helped, you know. He wasn't a face type, or you know, a kind of person who would just go along with what other people thought. So for many years, for example, I resisted the the, the practice of metta because I just felt I was being brainwashed and I hated it. So I, I gave a talk which is called Coming to Grip with Meta. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened to it, but it was really a descri- description of how eventually once I became less identified with my thinking, you know, more detached, I didn't feel my thinking was me and mine and, you know, what I was, then I was able to use my thoughts much more skillfully. It's like I look at my soul just as an energy that was part of me, part of my brain, part of what my brain does, it thinks. And I could just um, act on it in a skillful way. So since then, I have, uh, you know, I delight in bringing um, good intention, you know. But I don't feel my intention is me. So it doesn't... Uh, it doesn't prevent me from just being the way I am, or you know, of, of uh, it doesn't pre- prevent me from seeing things clearly, you know, because I've suddenly put another filter in front of my my mind, you know. It's just informing my life in a different way, which pleases me, you know, which 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 uplifts my heart. So I like to, it's like speaking to your heart. You know, Ajahn Chah made a lot of that. He used to say, speak to your heart, speak to yourself, you know. So we can do that. May I be well, may I be at peace, you know. And then the same spirit of inquiry that I was speaking to you about, you know, also apply to your questions. Uh, Noticing cause and effect. You have noticed that when you are in a, in, a, in, a pos, in a position of bare attention, this intention is an extra thing, okay? So you know that already. Okay, that's good. You've experienced that. Now, notice when a good int- something positive or skillful intention is cultivated in you, you, you make something out of it. Notice the result of that. That will guide you, you know, how to use those intentions skillfully. That's how we go about, really. I mean, that's how I learned. I learned just, you know, sur le tas, we say in French. I don't know how you call that, you know. Uh, like field work, you know. And just practicing. Not knowing whether, you know, whether it's going to work or not. Not knowing, you know. But at some point, you have to have that kind of faith and confidence that you will only know by doing it, in other words, you know. Okay. And you have the teaching of the Buddha to give you some clue on how to go about things, you know. <coughs> so it's not one thing or another. It's just all means are have a, their place at a certain time and a certain situation. Okay, so we can close.